planning this conference, they said, who in the world are we going to have speak at after lunch when you have some of the finest speakers in town? And then Harry Reader is going to be the wrap-up. It's got to be someone with really thick skin who doesn't care if people listen to him or not. Well, that's the president of Westminster Seminary right there. So that's why I'm here. I'm just, I'm just the water boy for this great conference. Uh, it is a privilege to be with you. And uh, as we talk about Calvin, we all have preconceived ideas of him. Some of us know him as the man who did the Institutes or the great Reformed father who... Uh, got theology really organized on a Protestant basis where there's really a church government. Uh, maybe some of you think of him as the person who burned Servetus at the stake. Some of you might think of him as your role model as a pastor who really works hard and burns himself out. There's lots of images of Calvin, and I'm not going to try to disabuse you of any or argue for any one best one, but I will take the task that I've been given, which is to talk about pre preaching and leadership, the public ministry of John Calvin. Now, as I begin, I think it is interesting to hear what Ford Lewis Battle said several years ago. You remember he developed the translation that still is most widely used for Calvin studies uh, today in the English language. And he wrote this, and I thought it was helpful. The scope of Calvin's labors embodies a deep unity. This unity asserted by Calvin in regard to his institutes and commentaries can be applied as well to his sermons, whereby the teachings of his writings are elaborated in answer to the spiritual needs of the people. In a sense, these sermons represent a living bridge between the scholarly exegete and the Christian man of action. So when one of the world's great Calvin scholars says, you know, it's really his sermons that help you to understand who he is, and they're united with his entire ministry, that really warrants the topic I've been given to speak on today. He goes on to say, even those students who have concentrated their studies on a narrow consideration of Calvin's theology can no longer neglect the study of the sermons in favor of the institutes and the commentaries. He's saying we need to understand the richness and the significance of Calvin's sermonic work. Well, this unity then of his work is reflected in my purpose with you today. We want to consider Calvin's prolific ministry that brought together his pen, his public policies, and his pulpit. Before we do that, we must understand Calvin's theological starting point. We must remember his Principia. Uh, if you think about Reformed epistemology, you might be familiar with languages like Principium Cognoscende Externum and Principium Cognoscende Internum. That is that inward principle of knowing and the external principle of knowing. These represent the inextricable union of the Word of God revealed and in Scripture with the illumination of the Holy Spirit. We need to start with Calvin here, because unless we get this right, we won't understand why he did what he did in the pulpit. And so let's just take a moment and remember the theology of word and spirit that Calvin develops. I'll read a few. I, I came to this one in, in book one of the Institutes, and I said, my goodness, Calvin was writing about me. I didn't know I would make it in the Institutes. It talks about an old, bleary-eyed man and I said, that's me, there I am. And so as I read these little quotes today, I will demonstrate that that's really true. But here's how he says it. Just as old or bleary-eyed men and those with weak vision, if you thrust before them a most beautiful volume, even if they recognize it to be some sort of writing, it can scarcely construe two words. But with the aid of spectacles, we'll begin to read distinctly. So scripture gathering up the otherwise confused knowledge of God in our minds, having dispersed our dullness, clearly shows us the true God. Basically says we can't see God clearly from anything unless the word of God enters into our reflection and thinking. We are unable to see the truth of God. The Bible is absolutely necessary. He goes on to say in the same section in book one of the Institutes, uh, chapter 6, he says, at any rate, there's no doubt that firm certainty of doctrine was engraved in their hearts so that they were convinced and understood 
that what they had learned proceeded from God. He's talking here about the patriarchs. And then he says, for by his word, God rendered faith unambiguous forever, a faith that should be superior to all opinion. So Calvin says, first of all, the scriptures are absolutely necessary to know anything truthful about God. And two, they move us out of the realm of opinion to the realm of certainty. Now, how do we have that certainty? Well, he goes on to explain more fully. And in the same section, he'll say, And it is therefore no wonder that those who are born in darkness become more and more hardened in their insensibility. For there are very few who, to contain themselves within bounds, apply themselves teachably to God's word. But they rather exult in their own vanity. Now, in order that true religion may shine upon us, we ought to hold that it must take its beginning from heavenly doctrine, and that no one can get even the slightest taste of right and sound doctrine unless he be a pupil of Scripture. He says the only way we're going to know the truth is through the Scriptures. You put this together. The Scriptures are necessary. They are authoritative. And as he goes on and talks about the Spirit, he will say they're autopistos. That is, they are self-authenticating. The scriptures convince us beyond opinion that they are the word of God. And without that conviction, the word of God is not the word of God. It's just something that can be discarded. And therefore, the authority of scripture is foundational. In chapter 7, he says this in book 1 of the Institutes. Hence, the scriptures obtain full authority among believers only when men regard them as having sprung from heaven, as if there the living words of God were heard. So this is Calvin's theology. If he believed that the Bible alone made truth about God knowable, that the Holy Spirit gave the word so that it was beyond opinion, that the word of God dispelled the noetic effects of sins and the darkness of epistemological failures by broken and fallen human beings, then the word of God is the only thing we have. What else belongs in the pulpit but the word of God? The word of God must be preached. And that explains why Calvin did nothing for his whole career but preach the word of God. As one of the scholars put it, Leroy Nixon, in his book entitled John Calvin, Expository Preacher, he said, the man of Geneva drew all of his sermons from the Bible. He preached from it as he found it, book by book and passage by passage, instead of going everywhere preaching the gospel. He stayed by the passage in hand. He strove to show clearly and strongly what the passage meant and what difference it ought to make in the hearts and lives of the hearers. He was therefore an expository preacher, one who was committed to expounding the word as it was before him. And I think it's interesting that T.H.L. Parker will make this comment on expository preaching as Calvin practiced it. With such a form, it is nearly impossible for the preacher to to deliver a religious speech on some subject near or remote from his text. In other words, you can't make up your ideas if you say, this is God's word, and I'm trying to understand it, and you don't know anything unless you understand it with me. So Calvin's preaching and teaching is a direct result of his commitment to the nature of the word of God as a true word, a required word, an authoritative word, a self-authenticating word, that gives us true knowledge of God. And so as we think about Calvin's approach then, we need to understand further that he meant that it was when it was preached properly, the preacher was also declaring the word of God. Now, this is a remarkable thought. Let me say that again. Calvin believed that when the word of God was being properly expounded and preached, The word of God didn't stop with what was on the pages of the Bible. But as the preacher preached what the Bible said and what it meant, he was speaking the word of God. Now he distinguished clearly the preacher from the Bible. But he believed the Holy Spirit that inspired the Bible was bringing forth the clarity of the truth of the gospel through the preacher. It's extraordinary emphasis. One writer of Calvin's uh, thinking put it this way, the sacramental element of Calvin's views hold the truly preached word to be the very word of God. He notes in communicating his word to the children of Israel 
God did not normally allow his voice to boom out as thunder directly from heaven, but rather God normally used the medium of the prophet when he had a word to speak to his people. So for Calvin, man's speech becomes God's word when God uses a man to communicate it to his people. This is diametrically opposed to the Bartian view that says when you read the Bible, if you listen and preach it, it becomes the word of God. He says, no, this is the word of God. And when you preach it, you are preaching the word of God and God is speaking through the preacher. My goodness, that would put fire in your belly if you're a Bible preacher. Calvin is saying, you're getting up and you are the mouth of God. You have his word, you're expounding it, and you are declaring it to be God himself speaking in the room where the people are. What a view. This is our forefather, Calvin. T.H.L. Parker puts it this way. But what made the word of the New Testament preachers into the word of God? Question mark. The answer is not quite simple. On the one hand, their word was the word of God in that it was the faithful interpretation of the being and activity of the word of God of Jesus Christ. More than that, however, is that faithful interpretation, it was a continuation of the activity of the word of God, Jesus Christ. But a continuation in the sense that he himself, Jesus Christ, the word of God, continued to work. The virtue lay not in the apostles, but in the word of God. Hence, it was not with the apostles alone that the preaching of the gospel was the word of God. The gospel would be the word of God, whoever proclaimed it. What Calvin theology is saying it's parallel to his doctrine of the Lord's Supper it is a sacramental reality this word is brings the real presence of Christ through the power of the Spirit word and sacrament are in Calvin's mind spiritual engagement with heaven itself well there's so much more we could say about that and so then if we understand his epistemology and doctrine of Scripture his understanding of how the Spirit of God is working through the proclaimed Word of God, this then explains the program that Calvin followed in terms of its frequency and scope. If Calvin believed that he had the privilege to have God speak to his people through his Word when he preached, he wanted to preach a lot because he believed his people needed to encounter God consistently. And so we hear such things as this, uh, Various scholars have just assembled their assessments. Uh, Bausma puts this preaching frequency and style this way for Calvin. In addition to these administrative and scholarly tasks, Calvin had heavy pastoral duties. He preached regularly and often. On the Old Testament, on weekdays at 6 in the morning, 7 in winter, every other week. On the New Testament, on Sunday mornings. And on the Psalms on Sunday afternoon. During his lifetime, he preached on the schedule some 4,000 sermons after his return to Geneva, more than 170 sermons a year. The importance he attached to his preaching is suggested by the fact that in reviewing the accomplishments of his lifetime on his deathbed, recorded by Theodore Beza, he mentioned his sermons ahead of his writings. Calvin said, my great contribution to Geneva is my preaching. And... All of that preaching. Steve Lawson, another uh, well-known preacher of our day, puts it this way. One noted expositor who gave attention to biblical preaching was the monumental reformer of Geneva, John Calvin. His passionate commitment to word-centered, text-driven preaching remained second to none. For 23 years, this Swiss pastor carefully expounded God's word to his congregation. In fact, Calvin was so devoted to preaching through the books of the Bible that his expositional series often took several years to complete. For example, his weekly preaching through the book of Acts took over four years. He then preached 46 sermons on 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 186 sermons on 1st and 2nd Corinthians, 85 sermons on the pastoral epistles, 43 sermons on Galatians, and 48 sermons on Ephesians. In his later years, he began preaching a harmony of the gospel in the spring of 1559 and continued to do so until his death five years later in 1564. During the same time, he preached 159 sermons on Job, 200 on Deuteronomy, 353 on Isaiah, 123 on Genesis, along with other expositions as well. Why did he preach so much? 
Because it was God speaking to his people. And he had the privilege of being the mouthpiece of God to his people. Why would he not preach so much? Why are you not preaching more if you believe this is the word of God? We continue on then and say, well, this is his scope. What kind of preacher ought to be preaching this word of God? Calvin certainly must think something about the person that has this extraordinary privilege of preaching God's word, and, and yes, he does. And so one of the things that we first of all hear is there needs to be a certain natural ability that God has provided. In his commentary in 1 Timothy 3, 2, Calvin says this, there are many who either because their utterance is defective or because they have not good mental abilities or because they do not employ that familiar language which is adapted to the common people, keep within their own minds the knowledge which they possess. Such person, as the phrase is, ought to sing to themselves and to the muses. He said, don't go to seminary and be a preacher if you don't have what it takes. You need to know how to communicate. You need to know how to think. And yes, you need to know how to translate your scholarly biblical knowledge into the language of those who are listening to you. And so Calvin amazingly got up, many scholars believe, with his Greek and Hebrew Bible in the pulpit, and he spoke extemporaneously, and he translated all of his knowledge to the people who were just normal tradesmen, day-to-day -day people. And when you read his sermons, they're filled with hilarity, fascinating images, and poignant realities of things that are going on in his day. That ought to challenge us. You've gone to seminary, you've been a pastor for a while. Can you also teach the Sunday school kids so they can understand you, if that's who God has put before you? Can you talk to the medical society when they invite you? And can you talk to the ladies club or the teenagers? That's part of our calling, Calvin says, to adjust that mental knowledge with ability to communicate. There's much we could say here. Calvin says eloquence is valuable but it should always be harnessed for the purpose of the word of God and not an end in itself. He will criticize Roman Catholic theatricality. He will talk about how some of the priests get up and preach and they weep and sob. I'm reminded of a story of a Southern preacher who started crying in a sermon. And somebody said, that was so powerful, I'd go back. And so exactly at the same moment, two hours later, the pastor was crying exactly the same. He said, this is theatrical, this isn't real. Are we making believe what we're doing? Are we preaching authentically from our hearts? Calvin says that ought to be part of who we are. There's so many other things we could say, and time is hastening, and uh, maybe someday I'll write up all these notes. I told John Curry I have a whole course now since he commissioned me to write this lecture. I'll have to put it together. But he tells us how our teaching will be effective. And he'll tell us in one of his uh, places how we need to find a middle position between excessive severity and excessive softness. This might be worth reading because I think ministers wrestle with that, don't we? How strong and harsh or how gentle and kind should I be? Well, here's what Calvin will say. Uh, a good pastor, he thought, says Bausma, who I'm quoting here, succeeded in preserving a middle position between excessive severity and excessive softness. But too many failed. On the one hand, quote, pretending zeal, some are always fulminating and forget that they are men. They show no sign of friendliness, but exude only bitterness, terrifying sinners so inhumanly without any sign of anguish or sympathy. They make God's word seem insulting and distasteful. On the other hand, some flatter their congregations, ignore the most serious iniquities, and mislead and destroy miserable men by their blandishments. And several examples can be given of that. And so I thought, well, can I come across anything where, was Calvin, here's a test for you. I want you to evaluate in your own mind. Is Calvin too soft or too harsh? He decided in one of his messages to talk about women's apparel in Geneva. So listen to this one. Is this harsh, too vehement, too soft, too tender? You decide. He says, women have been allowed for a long time to become increasingly audacious. Besides speech apart, they wear such provocative clothes that it's hard to discern whether they are women or men. They appear in new dresses and trinkets, so that some new disguise is daily to be seen. They come decked out in peacock tail fashion, so the man cannot pass within three feet of them without feeling, as it were, a windmill sail swirling past him. <laughs> 
Ribald songs, too, are part of their behavior. You didn't read that in the Institutes, did you? That's why you had to read Calvin's sermons. It has some really humdingers. Now, was he being too vehement there or too soft? Or is that exactly what Geneva needed? That's hard to answer that from this point of view. But Calvin says a preacher who is preaching the very word of God needs to find the ability sometimes to hit hard and sometimes to have grace. And we need to know the ability. And one of the great dangers that we need to recognize is that we can get proud if we're given the privilege of having the, the pulpit. Calvin preached from an extraordinary pulpit in a beautiful cathedral, Saint Pierre in Geneva. And in his sermons on Deuteronomy, he says this, As for those who proclaim the word of God and have charge of leading others, how unfortunate they are if they think that they ought to be exempt from the common ranks and may despise others. And he says this, and that's in their arrogance and pride, they despise others. He says, for it would be better if they broke their necks while mounting the pulpit than to be unwilling to be the first to walk after God and to live peaceably with their neighbors, demonstrating that they are the sheep of our Lord Jesus Christ's flock. How about that? When you go into your pulpit, say, Lord, I'd rather break my neck today than come up here and be arrogant before the people of God. How about that? That's Calvin. I'd wish you'd break your neck. Then you get up there with your arrogant preaching. The humility of the preaching of the gospel is part of what Calvin was concerned about. And yes, preparation was important. Uh, Calvin was a nonstop student of the word of God, and so he could preach extemporaneously because he was coming out of a nonstop life of studying and teaching the Bible. He could apply it with such great grace. He knew his theology. But he puts it this way, if I should enter the pulpit without deigning a glance at a book and should frivolously think to myself, oh, well, when I preach, God will give me enough to say and come here without troubling to read or thinking what I ought to declare and do not carefully consider how I must apply Holy Scripture to the education of the people, then I should be an arrogant upstart. So how about that? When you step up into the pulpit and you decide to wing it, I said, you're an arrogant upstart. Who, who do you think you are that you can come into the place of preaching God's word and not even look at a book, not even prepare? Oh, well, God's going to give me a word. Yeah, he might give you a word of breaking your neck, getting into the pulpit. That might be the word. So Calvin is reminding us the people who handle the word of God ought to have the highest sense of their responsibility of preaching the word of God and being prepared. I think the classic example of Calvin being clearly diligent in his preaching, is that you remember that when he was exiled for three years and had the joy of preaching in a relatively calm French exile church in Strasbourg, when he came back after three years because the Reformation Geneva was falling apart and they needed him back. Do you remember what he did? Well, this is what Parker puts. Calvin preached through whole books of the Bible Sunday after Sunday or day after day. Indeed, to such a length that he carried this that is, he wrote in a letter soon after his return to Geneva in 1541. On his first Sunday in Saint-Pierre, he continued from the place where he had stopped on Easter Day, 1538, three years earlier, by which I indicated that I had interrupted my office of preaching for a time rather than that I had given it up entirely. He knew exactly where he stopped. They picked up again because his mission was to honor the word of God. He was prepared. But three years of ministry in between, he came to the very next verse and said, this is where we were now. This is where we must pick up again. Extraordinary because he wanted people to see that he loved the word of God with this kind of depth. Well, there's much we could say. We need to remember that there was so much of his preaching. And the sad fact is that we'll never get all of his sermons. They hired, the, especially the French refugees, hired one of the world's first great stenographers, developed his own form of shorthand, and day after day could write down 6,000 words in a sermon and get most of them down. That's why we have his sermons. Calvin didn't write them down. They're extemporaneous. The refugees from France so wanted to hear Calvin, they said, we can't let them disappear. We owe them a great debt. And uh, what is interesting, years later, when the library at Geneva had run out of space and they needed some money, they decided to clean out some of their works. And 
one of the writers says this, not all Calvin's sermons have yet been published. Many, indeed, have disappeared. Early in the 19th century, the pastor in charge of the Bibliothèque de Genève, where they were stored, sold most of the volume of Calvin's manuscript sermons by weight, as presumably as waste paper. And although some were eventually recovered, about 1,000 were permanently lost. I'm glad we have a better archivist and librarian here at Westminster. So we're not going to th throw away John Murray's sermons, I guarantee you. But Calvin's sermons had been kept because they were cherished. Why were they? Because he believed and his people believed that he had been given the ability to preach the word of God, and it was the basis of their ministry and of their lives. By the 1800s, they long had abandoned that theology. Oh, we don't need Calvin. Just so much paper, let's get rid of it. It's waste paper. And we can see that shift in place after place as the heritage of godly preaching is abandoned. May it not be said of us. Well, we have, as one writer puts it, spent a large time in this book devoted to Calvin's preaching. But that is necessary because if this is not fully seen, it is impossible to do justice to his work in Geneva. Preaching by Calvin must be given a prominent place. And to the extent I can call myself a student of Calvin, his sermons have been neglected, and it's a shame. And one of the things I hope we can do as preachers is go back and see how he did it. Well, then, what was the sermon attempting to do as a good summary after we talked about the authority from which it comes, the frequency and spiritual presence by which it comes, the preparation of the minister. At the end of the day, the reason that the sermon is so important in Calvin's theology, he writes this way, as often as we come to the sermon, we are taught of the pre free promises of God to show us that it is his pure goodness and mercy that we must entirely repose that we must not be grounded on our own merits or anything that we can bring on our side, but that God must hold out his hand to us to commence and accomplish all. And this, as Scripture shows us, is applied to us by our Lord Jesus Christ, and that in such a way that we must seek him entirely, and that Jesus Christ alone must be our advocate. That, I say, is shown us every day. It is also declared to us that God's service does not consist in imagining foolish devotions, that we must serve God in obedience. After we are shown that, we must sacrifice our hearts and our affections. He goes on, the sermon is a place of receiving God's grace, being called to repentance and to a new life of obedience. So then with that summary, if you will, of Calvin the preacher, the question then is how did that preaching become a form of public leadership? How did he take what was going on in his theology, his life, his preparation, and his proclamation, how did this then begin to change the public? Was his preaching a public preaching, that is, in the sense of public theology, touching not just the spirituality of the church, but also the magistrate, the public square, and public policy? Well, one of the things we begin to realize is that when Calvin was given finally the privilege after his exile to begin to organized the Reformation in Geneva, he created what were called the ecclesiastical ordinances. And it begins by saying, these are developed so that the preacher will do both public and private ministry. Right from the beginning, he said, this is about public ministry. I'm going public. He was reforming Geneva. He was reforming a city. He knew that that city had been engulfed by a worldview that had been so shaped by human merit and tradition and non-biblical religious and secular thought that everything had to be touched. The Reformation needed to touch everything from top to bottom. And so in his preaching, he recognized that there was an absolute necessity to begin to talk about whatever the church and the culture needed in his preaching. And so there's many things that we could do, but let me summarize this because his life is extraordinarily rich in his contribution. I've mentioned, first of all, the ecclesiastical ordinances, structuring, if you will, the church for a public and private ministry. A second thing that Calvin insisted on 
now that he had the opportunity to bring the Reformation to the city, was the creation of a consistory. Now, the consistory in Geneva is an interesting structure. It's not exactly easy to compare it to a church that you know has a consistory. So let's think about it this way. First of all, Geneva was a republic. It did not have a monarch. It was ruled by a collective of senators or a council with syndics, representatives. There was a larger group of 200, a smaller group, and four syndics that ruled that. That was the structure. When Calvin came along, he said, it's not enough. We need to have a consistory. What was the consistory? It was made up of all the preachers who were on the payroll of the city. Yes, it was a state church that they would be there. They would have a representative of one of the syndics, the four leaders that would help rule them, and they would be part of the discussion of how they would handle the spiritual and political and a relational life of the city. They would have a working together relationship to address issues. And so one of the key parts that came up was the idea of discipline. Now this would be a great uh, opportunity to study the Reformation. You remember when Calvin was in Strasbourg, he studied with Martin Butzer for three years during his exile. And Butzer wanted to have a discipline brought to Strasbourg and he failed. They did not want it. Calvin had tried to bring some sort of discipline, remember where he said to some of the noble families that had not come to confess their sins and to get things right before the Lord's Supper, he refused their coming. That caused him to be exiled. Now the discipline is available and they, the council of the city says, yes, we will let you have uh, the opportunity for excommunication, but that will be our responsibility and not the consistories. Yes, you've, you've convinced us we need it, but we, the political side will handle that. And Calvin said, no. He said, you can either exile me again or kill me, but I'm not going to let anybody come to the table that has not been under the proper review of the spiritual leaders of the church. Let me tell you, that's called public theology at the highest level. He was looking at the magistrates and said, we're going to run this. He said, no, you're not. You're not going to run our church. The church is going to run itself under the word of God. We will work together, but the church will be the church, and you may not take it. He said, exile me again or kill me here. Well, the discipline began to take place, and it's a fascinating story. If you want to read some wonderful squabbles in a church, read the story of what happens as Calvin begins to bring reformation in Geneva. One of the things that will happen is that they decide that they need to clean up the taverns. Now, I don't know how you feel about the taverns. Some of us like taverns, some of us don't. But it was interesting that they had a plan to make sure the tavern was more godly. So this is what, what it looked like. One social historian described what Calvin sought to do through the consistory in the taverns of Geneva. And the laws that were passed not only leveled against the evil of drunkenness, but was also positive in character, an attempt to penetrate with the Christian spirit this area, too, of Genevan life. It might be termed, therefore, the sanctification of the tavern. The many taverns, to give a polite name to these wine shops, were closed, and their place were named five abbeys. How about that? The abbey was the place where you went to have a, a fellowship, a pub. Uh, it had a religious name, a ring. They were to be run not merely as respectable, but as religious public houses. They were to be non-profit making. Everyone was to say grace before and after eating and drinking. There was to be a French Bible on the premises. Swearing, slandering, and dancing were forbidden. Psalms might be sung, and anyone so moved might address the rest of the company uh, for their edification. He wanted to turn the taverns into small group Bible studies, and that didn't last. That was one attempt, and it didn't work. Another thing is that they passed a law that you are not allowed to dance. Now, we all have different views on all sorts of things, but dancing was prohibited in Geneva. Calvin maybe went too, went too far, but as a result of it becoming the law as the consistory and as the little council worked together to establish rules, some of the blue bloods of Geneva, they call themselves les enfants de Genève, the children of Geneva, we're the true blue. They said, we always dance at weddings. So the really rich and elite danced at weddings. They broke the law. And guess what? 
They got put in jail. Now, that didn't make anybody very happy, okay, except for the very strict. And for. So what, what ends up happening is that they say, you can't let this rich and noble family of Geneva be fined excessively. So they brought down the charges. They made the fine very small and just, just gave them a kind of slap on the wrist. And what did Calvin do? Calvin said, if this is the way you're going to treat my spiritual leadership, I will not enter the pulpit again. And there was nearly a riot that broke out because they needed to have Calvin. They were convinced he was bringing the word of God to them. And so the council backed down and reimposed the proper standard. So I want to pause for a moment. I'm not suggesting that dancing is wrong, that taverns should become small group Bible studies. But I am asking the question, is there any engagement with political life at all? For Calvin, he took what we might think are the more minor things, and he was ready to stand up and be counted for the sake of his witness and ministry in the city. So Calvin was indeed a public theologian. Probably the most amazing example is that uh, there was a violation of the Seventh Commandment by one of the leading families, and the things continued to escalate until finally Calvin uh, was uh, struggling with the leaders. Amy Perrin is the name of the person, and it came to its head in 1555, just as Calvin was getting ready to do his sermon series on Deuteronomy, which is on the law of God. So he was getting ready to preach on this, and all of these things are happening, and a riot breaks out. They hated Calvin. People stopped coming to the supper. Why? Because they hated Calvin. Uh, they changed his name from Calvin by dropping a couple letters and called him Cain. You know, if you do a little ellipsis there, you get Calvin as Cain. He's, he's the man of wickedness. We, we can't have it. Well, the riot backfired, and it ended up creating such a protest against the leaders that they were forced to leave. And Calvin, believe it or not, was now in charge of the city. How did he do it? He did it by simply asking that godly standards would be maintained and not backing down. I, I have an application I wish I could spend some time on, but I've heard this in more than one continent from Christian leaders, that people who have come to faith after being part of the assault against the church have said they were shocked as they began to try to destabilize Christian witness through their concerted efforts in government and elsewhere how silent and inactive the church was. They were amazed. They didn't stop us. They didn't care. We don't show up. Calvin showed up. You may not like the way he did it, but there's such bigger things that are going on. Do we even show up? Are we being counted? Calvin was a public theologian by necessity. Yes, we might critique him. He went too far, and by our vantage point in time, he didn't understand religious liberty. But he did understand this. That if you're the minister of the gospel and you believe you have the word of God and the culture is abandoning things and attacking the, the glory of your Savior, shouldn't you be heard? Calvin said, of course you should be heard. This is our calling. This is what a public witness uh, calls us to do. So at any rate, while there's so much we could do and I, uh, our time, as I say, is limited, as all of this happens in 1555, Ten years of struggle since Calvin came back from his exile. The upper elites, sometimes called the libertines, are fighting against him, and there's all the collision and problems. And finally, the opposition implodes. And Calvin is given a unique opportunity to now lead. And as he leads in this context, he is preaching uh, his uh, sermons on the Ten Commandments. They just coincide in a remarkable way. I don't have time to do it, but Benjamin Farley, who uh, helped retranslate them and uh, introduce them, he makes the point as you read through the specific parts of Deuteronomy 5 on the Ten Commandments, at the moment in time, it's clear that Calvin was regularly in his sermons engaging the issues of his city. He was not afraid to talk about what was going on and what the Word of God would say. And of course, he understood, which many have forgotten, that the law, yes, can slay us because no one can live it, but the law also 
is what we love as Christians because it's the Holy Spirit's writing it on our hearts, the third use of the law. The law shows us how to love God and how to love our neighbor, and Calvin was seeking to develop that. So there's much more that we could say there, but as I say, that would take us far afield. Let me just summarize what we said this way uh, in this context. Farley writes this in his uh, work on, the, on Calvin's sermons on the Ten Commandments. Far more could be said of the defeat of the Libertine Party or of the Peronists or of the conspiracy of May 16th, but the collapse of Calvin's opponents is emphasized here as the tumultuous events that belong to that decade of conflict can be sensed in almost every passage of the Decalogue sermons. Throughout the series, Calvin never tired of stressing the importance of a God-fearing and well-ordered state supported by a responsible and decent citizenry led by a pious and accountable magistracy. So Calvin in his sermon will speak to the magistrate, he'll speak to the people, he'll speak to the family, he'll speak to the church members, to the elders, because the word of God applies to all. He was not afraid to do that. As we conclude then, as our time is coming to an end, I want to talk more specifically about how Calvin's ministry, through his preaching, through his unified ministry, as we remember from Fort Lewis Battles in my opening quote, how they all work together, well, he sought to impact the public. And the first way he did that is that he recognized that Geneva was one little blip on the map, but the Christian faith had a God that was the Lord of the nations. And so what we find in Calvin is that he never forgot that someday the kings will bow before the King of kings and Lord of lords. Have you ever noticed when he wrote his first institutes in 1536, and he had that famous letter of appeal that was printed with it to Francis I, the king of France. In every edition thereafter, that letter is always included. Why? He was saying, I am continuing through this to address the king and the kings, that we are not seditious. We are following the word of God, and we want you to know who we are and what we stand for. It was a public witness in every issue of the Institutes. It's fascinating. As I was looking at the various uh, commentaries that Calvin has, that in many cases are just collections of his sermons that had been transcribed. Did you know that some of them were collected and that he had not even edited them? And they were published. And in a couple cases, they were collected, they were put together in print and dedicated to kings to King James and Queen Elizabeth. And in the introduction it says, I'm sorry I've not had opportunity to even review these messages that I preached, but I believe they're worthy of your royal attention because I'm bringing to you the word of God. I wonder how many of you would let anything you've ever written go out without at least a quick edit. And if it was going to the President of the United States, might you not ask a professional editor to try to take a look at it if you thought he would even pay attention to it? Calvin said to send them on. Well, how could he do that? Because he was always a public theologian. Every moment he was speaking, he was speaking to the kings. He was speaking to the common people because he was honoring the King of kings and Lord of lords. If he could honor him, he believed he could speak to everybody. His word was appropriate because he was serving God. Uh, Calvin had remarkable relationships with many public and private leaders. His letters are another form of his pen. Uh, his communication by letters with royalty and with other reformers is a study in its own right. Uh, I, let me, uh, too, just one thing of my own horn here. I wrote an article. I did, gave this back at ETS in 2011 has subsequently been published. It's called Calvin's Final Verdict on the Augsburg Confession. Uh, you know the Augsburg Confession was a Lutheran confession. Calvin, believe it or not, wrote a confession of faith so that the Augsburg Confession would not be brought into France. Fascinatingly, why? He was afraid it would create conflict. And so he was writing to the King of Navarre. He was writing to other royal figures, saying, we don't need to have any other confession. This is our confession. He wrote this to say, this is what we believe here. And I, I offer that to you if you want to see what a public theologian looks like. His preaching became public witness 
that was concerned for the well-being of the church in France, of which he was not even a part because he was in exile. By the way, isn't it interesting that as Calvin did all of this work, he was not even a citizen of Geneva until the last three years of his life. He did it as a stranger, as an alien, a refugee, an exile. But he was not an exile and a refugee in the kingdom of God. He was an ordained minister of the gospel, just as you are. Our church, our kingdom for Christ belongs everywhere. And he recognized that. His polity, as we know, as he organized his group with the consistory and with the, uh, 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 the republic form of government in Geneva, people began to ask the question, what do we do with this? We, we wanted, we've learned your wisdom. Can we apply it? Calvin helped them to shape it for national levels. What would it look like if we moved from this little city-state, this imperial-like city, to the whole nation of Protestant France or the Netherlands or Scotland? And his ideas, he worked with them to expand them because he's a public theologian. He said, what we're doing here, it's different on a national level, but let's figure out how we can make it work. On the local level, yeah, the, what about local laws? The laws of marriage need to be writ, rewritten, redeveloped. Calvin applied his legal training to write the marital laws of Geneva that began the, to be the standard all throughout Europe, wherever the... Protestant faith went. So letters, his polity, and it, it spread, and he began to act, uh, impact countries. He established one thing after another that showed that his theology was public. Let me conclude in my last five minutes by reading a portion of a paper that I have never published, but at least I, I wanted to engage it this way, because sometimes we hear about the spirituality of the church as being the essence of our reformed heritage. And we need to learn how to put that in balance with Calvin's vision for a public witness of the church. Does, do we throw out the spirituality of the church if we have a public witness? Well, let me read just a few final pages, and with this I'll conclude. The spirit of the Calvinistic Reformation recognized it possessed a prophetic calling to address the magistrate. Its declarative power was to reflect all three of the offices of Christ, prophet, priest, and king. The Reformed Church has proclaimed the lordship of Christ, who is king of kings and lord of lords, had a message to be heeded by every earthly monarch. In regard to the state, King Jesus was not just to be sequestered as the church's prophet and priest but he was to be king and lord as well. We can see the basis for the declarative power of the church in regard to the magistrate in Calvin's exposition of the limited obedience a believer owes to a magistrate in the context of his discussion of the fifth commandment. This is coming from the Institutes. He says, The titles, Father, God, and Lord, so belong to him alone that as often as we hear any one of these, our mind cannot fail to be struck with an awareness of his majesty. Those persons, therefore, with whom he shares these titles, he lights up with a spark of his splendor, so that each may be distinguished according to his degree. Thus, in him who is our Father, we should recognize something divine, because he does not bear the divine title without cause. He who is a prince or a lord has some share in God's honor. But we also ought in passing to note that we are bidden to obey our parents only in the Lord. Ephesians 6.1 this is apparent from the principle already laid down, for they sit in that place to which they have been advanced by the Lord who shares with them a part of his honor. Therefore, the submission paid to them ought to be a step toward honoring that highest father. Hence, if they spur us to transgress the law, we have a perfect right to regard them not as parents, but as strangers who are trying to lead us away from obedience to our true father. So should we act toward princes, Lords and every kind of superiors, it is unworthy and absurd for their eminence so to prevail as to pull down the loftiness of God. On the contrary, their eminence depends upon God's loftiness and not to lead us to it. So then, as a Reformed pastor, Calvin was not a shrinking violent in addressing matters of the magistrates, legitimate use of power. In fact, he once bluntly declared that a tyrant should rather be spit at than be obeyed. John T. McNeil summarizes the extensive concern that Calvin brought in his writings to the work of the magistrate in the following words. 
Calvin's concentration on biblical studies and his labor and care for the church did not eradicate his political interests but gave to it a new dimension. The magistrate became for man's earthly order of life a vicar of God. It need not surprise us to find that from his commentary in Seneca's treatise on clemency of 1532 until that hour in 1564 when from his deathbed he urged the magistrates of Geneva so to rule as to preserve his, this republic in its present happy condition. His writings are strewn with penetrating comments on the policies of rulers and illuminating passages of the principles of government. And so maybe it's appropriate just to take a moment and hear the words that Calvin uh, spoke as they're recorded by Beza as the Senate of Geneva came to his deathbed. Can you imagine that? The, the most authoritative part of the Genevan government came to Calvin because they didn't want Calvin to come to them. They thought he's too frail. How can you do that unless you have a public witness? The government came to talk to him as he's dying. And what, what, what did they say? And so here's Calvin. He says, I know the disposition and character of each of you, and I know that you need exhortation. Even among those who excel, there is not one who is not deficient in many things. Calvin's preaching to them and saying, you guys got to get it right. You got to be more sanctified, brothers. Let everyone examine himself, and wherein he sees himself to be defective, let him ask of the Lord. We see how much iniquity prevails in the councils of this world. Some are cold, others negligent of the public good. Give their whole attention to their own affairs. Others indulge their own private affections. Others use not the excellent gifts of God as is meet. Others ostentatiously display themselves and from overweening confidence insist that all their opinions shall be approved of by others. I admonish the old not to envy their younger brethren whom they may see adorned by God's goodness with some superior gifts. The younger again I admonish to conduct themselves with modesty, keeping far aloof from all haughtiness of mind. Let no one give disturbance to his neighbor, but let everyone shun deceit and all that bitterness of feeling which in the administration of the republic had led many away from the right path. These things you will avoid if each keeps within his own sphere and all conduct themselves with good faith in the department which has been entrusted to them. In the decision of civil causes, let there be no place for partiality or hatred. Let no one pervert justice by oblique artifices. And he says, finally, I again entreat you to pardon my infirmities, which I acknowledge and confess before God and his angels and also before you, my much respected lords. Having thus spoken and prayed to Almighty God, that he would crown them more and more with his gifts and guide them by his Holy Spirit for the safety of the whole republic, giving his right hand to each. He left them in sorrow and in tears, all feeling as if they were taking a last farewell of their common parent. So I conclude with these words. To be a Calvinist was to believe that the world was to change by the Bible through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The pulpit ministry's proclamation of God's word produced that change by the godly works of the people of God who had been taught by faithful pastors teaching the scriptures. Thus the Calvinist pulpit was a public witness through a public theology to conform the public to the word of God. Indeed, Calvin was a public theologian who impacted his world and subsequent history through his leadership from the pulpit by tireless exposition of the very word of God and relentless application of the word to his culture. Beza put it so beautifully as he reflected on his life. He said, Calvin's life is as easy to vilify as his godly, productive life is to duplicate. May God give us at least a little more of a willingness to believe that we preach the very word of God and want to preach it often frequently with a conviction that is the power of God to change the world. Believe it or not, for generations to come, we're talking about Calvin. He's still changing the world. Praise God. Thank you.